Okay, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and all the ships at sea coming to you live from the Davis Center for Human Ecology. Uh, it's time for another Human Ecology Forum. And once again, it's an enormous delight to bring you one of our distinguished alums and their partner. So many of you folks who've been around a while will remember Cora and probably remember as fondly as I do, Cora and the Flora and um, some wonderful open mics um, back in the day. Cora has been gone low these many years. And as you will see, she has been quite busy in that time. So what we're gonna get the taste of today is the project that she and her partner Jose have been working on, aren't we there yet? And I would like to stress to everybody that they are actually here live on campus and they're fully vaccinated and they have brought the bus that you will see something of in the next 40 minutes. And they're welcoming people to come in the next 48 hours and actually get a quick tour of this mobile studio and um, tiny house and be able to talk to them one on two about the actual project as it goes. So without further ado, um, welcome everybody. And I'm gonna hand this over to Art We There. Thank you. Hi. Okay, so first I just wanna make sure, can everybody hear us correctly? You can give a thumbs up. Excellent. I see Ken giving us a thumbs up. Hi. So it's so wonderful to be here. Thank you so much to John for helping organize this. Thank you for having us at the Human Ecology Forum. Thank you to Darren for being so awesome about letting us come with our 35 foot monstrosity and bringing it to campus. <laughs> it is such a pleasure to be here. Um, beyond words, I am excited and happy to be here. It's been 12 years since I've been to MDI. So this is a treat in so many different ways. So without further ado, I know the people who are watching know me, um, but we can begin introducing ourselves uh, to those who maybe don't know us. So my name is Cora Rose Lewicki. I graduated class of 2010, and in short, I am a musician. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm Jose Vilches, and I'm a visual artist, and I'm really happy to be here. So thank you for the welcoming. Uh, Cora had told me so many stories about her college time here and my first time in Maine. And it's beautiful. So far, what I've seen looks really beautiful. Can wait for Saturday so that I can get a tour around the entire uh, college <laughs> and area. Yeah. Um, and what do you do? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm a visual artist. I already said that, yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So uh, we're just going to dive right in and give you a little intro on, on what the heck we do and what we've been working on. Mm -hmm. So our project is called Art We There Yet? Whimsical because, you know, we want to make sure we don't always take ourselves too seriously. And in short, let me see if I can get this to, there we go. I'm going to move this over. So this is our elevator speech about our project. Every, every project, every business or whatever, um, any nonprofit always has to have that elevator speech. So this is ours. Aren't We There Yet is a project to travel 30,000 miles from Alaska to Argentina, 23 countries of the Americas, creating art and music inspired by the Americas, by the people and the landscapes that we encounter, all while giving back to communities along the way sharing what we have to give as artists through the form of public murals and songwriting workshops, and especially in places that don't usually have access to a lot of funding for the arts. So that in a nutshell is our project. Um, you can see this was actually um, one of, we have, we have had about four or five different maps at this point in time. At this point in time, we stopped creating maps. We're like, it just doesn't work. This was one of the plans. And as you can tell, it already looks all wonky. Like who planned that? Um, this was post COVID. So you can kind of see what happened here. Um, but eventually our route, we started here in Florida. Uh, we've been trying for, this is the fourth summer now, trying to get ourselves to Alaska. So this summer is our last hurrah to get to Alaska. And then eventually the end point of the project will be here down in Tierra del Fuego. Yeah, a part that is not included in this map is the Baja Peninsula, which we did uh, last year, last winter. We spent the winter traveling the entire Baja Peninsula and then we came back up north so that we could do uh, Alaska this summer. 
Yeah. So, and of course, this is all taking place in a bus that we took and turned into a mobile art and recording studio on wheels. So the bus, which is currently in the North lot, charging up her batteries. We got great sun today. Um, it's 35 feet long, 198 square feet of living space inside. It's a fully off grid, tiny home with room actually for visiting, visiting guests. We both sleep in there and then there's room for three extra people to sleep in there. It has a recording studio, space for Jose to do his videography, photography, editing. It has a space that can be turned basically into any kind of artistic work, printmaking, painting, whatever our visiting artists have to do, they have space to, to create their work. And then of course, one of our favorite parts is the inspiration station. <laughs> The deck. The deck. Yeah. The deck. Um, this is one side of the mural on, on the bus, and then the other side is actually completely different. So if you want to see what it looks like from the other side, you'll have to come visit us tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and then the next part, we just wanted to kind of give you a little background on. So why are we? So why? You know, why would you want to do this? Who are, who are you to try and do this kind of project? And yeah, what are you trying to share with people in the first place? So, I don't yeah, know. Right. Yeah, so I am a musician at heart. Um, actually, here at COA, I studied um, as you know, well, COA, so I studied like this and this and this and this, and then I just like found the way they'd all connected. But um, I studied politics, econ, Spanish, history, and it, classes with John Cooper, but mostly I just study like the humanities while I was here. Um, but music has always been something that I've always done as a way to be a person, to a way to reflect and to, to see the world and or the way to process what I see happening in the world. And beyond that, the way that I get inspired by the way that I really get inspired is through travel. So it was only a natural thing to eventually be able to find a way to marry those two things, music and travel, um, and they both feed off of one another. And so that's that's me, just music girl. <laughs> yeah, and from my side, um, I share the passion for cultures and travel with Cora. And uh, I grew up in Nicaragua and moved to Miami when I was 17 years old and always with that dream of traveling. Uh, eventually, uh, 10 years later, after moving to Miami, I decided to go to college and decided to go to art school. So I went to art school in Chicago. I studied at the Art Institute of Chicago. And right after graduation, um, I decided to want to do, I wanted to do a, a one year trip around the world, which took me to China. And I ended up eventually moving to China to teach art. I was working with some uh, classmates who are Chinese. And that's where I met Cora, all the way across the world in China. And the idea of traveling um, across the Americas has always been in the back of my mind. And after visiting 70 countries around the world, I kind of felt that urge to do, to continue traveling, but do it with uh, more of a purpose in mind. Because uh, up to that point, uh, I've been backpacking around and just taking photographs and, and getting inspiration from the world and the cult cultures that I was that I was able to, to visit and, and be a part of. So when I met Cora in China, I proposed this idea of buying a school bus and turn it into our mobile studio on wheels so that we can create art inspired by the Americas. But also coming from a third world country like Nicaragua, I also wanted to give back to those communities. And, and what we have to give back is what we know in the arts and having the memory when I grew up having a lot of uh, artists come in and visit my hometown and do puppet shows or uh, circus performances and all kinds of things, music as well. Um, I thought that maybe we can travel around uh, with chorus music and my visual art painting murals, teaching songwriting workshops and painting workshops. So we did. It took a whole year of planning and then almost a whole other year of building the bus. It's a long haul. Yeah. yeah. And it's been a long haul. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's just the beginning. <laughs> and it's just the beginning. Um, I mean, I don't. We don't need to explain to you guys what happened in 2020. The whole world just kind of 
stopped and then things shift and then thing and then nothing could be planned and and so it was just kind of like a bumbling through life sort of year and um, even 2021 and even now still we're kind of like what's going to happen so um, I think for the whole world this has been a big lesson in humility and patience yep. and flexibility so um, you're kind of catching us in our own process, you know, I think we oftentimes when we meet another person, we always think like, oh, we see how somebody's doing that. We think, oh, they got that all figured out. Or we just kind of see the, the glossed surface of something. I and mean, we don't realize everybody's, everybody's in process. Everybody's figuring themselves out even till the day they die. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we wanted to talk a little bit and show you a little bit more of what we're talking about with the work that we've been doing. Um, so here are some examples of some of the murals that we've done in different places. The idea behind the mural projects is that they are, um, they are a gift to whatever community that we're going through. Um, sometimes we have a sponsor that covers our time and the cost of materials. Um, sometimes we don't, it's kind of 50-50. Um, either way, whoever's receiving the mural is receiving it for free. So the idea is there's this, there's this gap in funding where a lot of communities that have this, this funding for the arts, they're able to bring people who are moving a 35 foot bus or having to pay for all this paint. They're able to fund that. And so that means the people who have money are the people who get the art. And um, that's an issue. So when you try and kind of connect the dots to help shift that to try and bring this kind of this kind of things to to communities that don't generally have that um, you can start to try and level the playing field of course you can't it, this is something that is a teamwork effort for people all across the world like we're not going to be able to paint every town right but, um, everybody has to like put their little grain of sand yeah. in. and that's what makes it beautiful about the murals is that i designed the murals but then together with the community, we all go and paint the murals uh, together. So people get ownership and they feel proud of the end product. And everyone can, when, once we are gone, uh, people in this community, they're able to, to, to look at this mural and, and, and be happy that they were part of it and be proud of the fact that they put their hands in this project. So yeah. that gives an extra layer of value to the communities. Yeah. So uh, to give you a sense, this, this one, let's see, these two murals were in Sparta, North Carolina, obviously, Sparta. And this was actually an idea of one of the volunteers who was there painting. She said, wouldn't it be cool if we made the art like crazy different because then we're putting the art in Sparta? <laughs> and everybody was like, oh. <laughs> so that, and this, this one here is at a school uh, that teaches um, folk music to students in, in the Appalachian Hills. Uh, it's an after-school program that helps get them away from um, any other kind of destructive things that could be going on after school, and it gets them into this building playing music instead. And it's really beautiful. They're super talented. Those kids can play like nobody's business. Yeah. So it's a really cool program. And this is the entrance to the school, and it was just a gross cinder block wall kind of stained. But now it's it's quite pretty. This was a pretty meaningful one. You want to yeah, th this one, we, this was a special experience, especially for me as an immigrant, because this happened in uh, the border with Brownsville, Texas, and Matamoros, Mexico. And this building is a homeless shelter, but it's also uh, an immigrant center where people who uh, are applying for asylum and they, get, they are allowed to, to come into the country they come to this building and they get clothing, food, and also they get legal advice uh, in, on their cases. Um, they make sure that they have a, a bus ticket to get to wherever destination they need to get to. And also they get legal advice and when they need to go see the judges and all that. So we painted this mural here, but we also crossed the border to, to basically a tent city on the other side in Matamoro. And we did a painting workshop with uh, migrant kids that were basically camping. They're waiting for their asylum cases to be able to come into the United States. And for, I think, how was it, five days, right? We walk two miles round trip mm -hmm. across the border. All week, yeah. Yeah, carrying paint and, and material so the kids can uh, have a little bit of a distraction by painting. You know, it was, 
it was a beautiful experience, but it was also a little sad. Yeah. We have a picture of that too in one of the slides coming up. Um, I think this next slide is more mural. Yeah, so more murals. <laughs> this this is our bus. This is 35 feet long. So that gives you a sense of how big this building was. This was a heck of a job. Um, this is a great before and after. So this is great. This building here was the Arts Council building. Uh, so this this was a town's Arts Council building. People would mistake it for an airplane hangar. Yeah, because it's right next to an airport. <laughs> it's right next to an airport. <laughs> so, so no longer, obviously. Now it's a landmark. People are like, well, you just turn at the colorful building. And yeah. people, there's no, nobody asks like yeah. what colorful building. <laughs> Yeah, he automatically became a point of reference in town. <laughs> yeah, so now there's no question which building is the Arts Council building. Um, yeah, this one was uh, in the same town as this. This is in Driggs, Idaho. And this is a coffee shop, actually. That's more like a community. It's, this is like if it's like tab, basically. This is take a break. I'll show you. Take a break later. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the coffee place where everybody goes and jab, hangs out and plays music. And um, and once again, this had this boring gray wall. And the first time we went to this coffee shop, we looked at that wall and we were like, God, that'd be a nice wall for a mural. <laughs> yeah. And then we were about to leave town and we got a text from, from the owner of this cafe saying, hey, want to paint my wall? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, manifested that one. Yeah. Yeah. And then this one at the lower corner here, uh, that was a very different one because it's in a, an event that is in this um, community. It's a ranch that help uh, kids in the communities with education and many other things. It's a, it's a Christian organization. They do beautiful work in the, in the community right outside of uh, La Paz in Baja California Sur. And they had this van that they used to, to go around uh, the neighborhoods and bring kids into the ranch to do a lot of activities. And eventually the van died. So obviously it has a lot of sentimental value. So all of the kids in the community uh, came to help us paint. And the beautiful thing is that inside they had complete artistic freedom to, to, uh, to just paint it inside the, the van. So it looks really cool inside. Yeah, yeah. Uh, more murals. We we can't talk too much about murals all day long because yeah, there's more. The, there's more to do. The murals but, all become one of the main elements when it comes for us uh, connecting to communities. It's a very powerful way to connect with the community and to be and to facilitate something that has lasting value long after you're gone. Um, this is just little glimpses of the of the music workshops and the and we do painting workshops as well. This was the the workshop at the border. Um, you can see it's just tarps on the ground and this is what we had to work with, but the kids didn't care. Yeah. They were just happy to play with paint. So, um, yeah, our, our workshops are a, a fun thing, a good experience. One of those kind of, it's not, it, it does not replace ongoing arts education. That's really, really, really important. Um, kids need ongoing arts education from a little age. Um, it, the, the research shows, I mean, how much that affects everything beyond just the intrinsic value of the arts, um, but it, the way that it affects so many other areas of life. Um, so kids need that ongoing, but it is always very helpful to have different things pop in, a puppet show, for instance, or this opportunity or this opportunity, these little seeds that get planted and right. maybe we'll grow to something or maybe we'll just be a cool experience, but yeah. either way, it's valuable. Um, so this is good. We got good. We can like give ten minutes per reflection before mm -hmm. we get into uh, question time. So we were thinking of a couple of different reflections to kind of share with you guys uh, about our time so far in this project. Um, some things that lessons learned, or just things that we feel are important to to note. And one of them was kind of the relationship with the unknown, um, how that has shifted and changed it, changed it, <laughs> changed for us. Um, I think I can, I can speak for myself and say like, um, so to begin with, when we started this project, 
Um, I think from the outside, it has looked very well calculated and, and very well planned, but it has been anything but. It has been a, a, a series of grand leaps of faith over and over and over and over again, and just leaping off of a cliff and hoping that there's a net underneath. So the first big leap that we took was obviously leaving our positions in China. That's where we met. We were both teaching. We had good jobs. We had good everything. And, and then we left all that saying, hey, we're going to go and do this thing that we don't even know if we can get funding for and, and just complete leap of faith. And it was scary, but um, there was a net there. And then the same deal when we finally got funding for the bus, then it was like, we don't know how to do this, but we're just going to start <laughs> <laughs> and, and just do it. And the net appeared after. So sometimes you have to take the leap for the net to appear like you can't you can't see it until you take the leap which is terrifying but i've been learning that lesson for myself more and more with this project and um i feel like you you had always said something like that about um how you have to take the first step or when you take the first step or something yeah something i feel like, like you know like everything in life as if you know if, if you're trying to figure something out and and never do anything to to figure it out then you will never know but as you go baby steps you know uh the way will be revealing you know what you have to do next to figure things out so i feel like this project has been like that it started as an idea that was in my head for many years while i was in college and then eventually met the right people the right person to do it and you know you just plan what you foresee and uh, we were talking about yesterday, you know, just plan to be disappointed because you plan so much that nothing goes as planned <laughs> and you have to reshape the plan. And that's just part of life and part of every, everything you do. It's, uh, you know, can be too obsessive with when the plan doesn't go as, as you planned. But uh, the idea is to, to keep it readjusting that plan, you know, because that plan is just basically a rough draft that you got to keep reshifting around to make it fit to the actual situation of the moment. And this project's been like that. It's been a, an up and down, you know, where it, the whole conversion thing, we didn't know how to build the interior of us, how to do plumbing and elect, electrical wiring and all that. And we figured out all as we as we went. And being on the road is kind of the same thing. Where are we going to live to? Where are we going to park the bus and sleep tomorrow? We don't know, but <laughs> we know that we'll figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. And that's a scary place. That's a, it's a, it's a fun place to finally get to because I'm much of a planner and I, I want to know how things are going to work out. I want to know where I'm going to sleep. I want to know how I'm going to make money. I want to know this before I take the step in that direction. Um, but an interesting and curious thing has been repeating. It's, it's been on repeat with this project where for one, you can plan the heck out of, it, out of everything and nothing will go the way that you plan. So there's that. Um, but also when you have a firm plan, you limit yourself from being able to say yes to the things that happen organically and, and spontaneously. And oftentimes those spontaneous and organic things that just happen that you could never have planned, sometimes those lead to the most amazing experiences and, and things that are way better than what you had planned to begin with. So when you stick too rigidly to the plan, you limit yourself from being able to grow with the moment. Yeah. And, and it's just been like a situation that's gone on repeat enough times that I'm like, okay, this is real. <laughs> yeah, and when, when we reflect back on the, the things that we've done and the places we've been and the people we've met, uh, the spontaneous moments are the ones that always come to mind because they were the richest moments. Yeah, and uh, and experiencing other cultures and other other people and the projects as well. Yeah, and the last thing about uh, on this reflection, which is good, we've got plenty of time. Um, was we've talked about this the the changing relationship with the unknown, where um, at least my pattern in the past more than with yours, I think um, I would get I would fear the unknown. It was a thing of fear. And now we're kind of hooked on it. You know, now, now we're like, we, we like the rush of being like, we don't know what's going to happen. And it's this exciting thing because you know, 
you know, like for instance, let's say we're about to go to a new community to do a mural and we've never met anybody there. We've never been to that place. We don't know where we're gonna park the bus, but all that we do know is that we're about to like open up the page to a whole new book, a whole new story with all these new characters and all these new memories. And that's the thing that's sure, we're like, we know that for sure. We know that there's gonna be adventures and there's gonna be all these things. And we, it's like, you know, you're, it's like about to open a novel. And, and that's like, it's like now the unknown has become this like, ooh, <laughs> what's gonna happen? We, we, we enjoy it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, for me, that's always been a, an exciting part of uh, being on the road, uh, having an experience of backpacking through many countries on limited budget. Uh, it's, it was always exciting to me. So that part of the project has always uh, excited me in a way, you know, just, just, I like not to know what's going to happen next, even if it's a huge challenge, because at the end of the day, that any troubles, any challenge that you, you go through, it only turns into another good story, you know, another good memory. Hopefully, yeah, it continues to be the case. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> we had our scariest moments, uh, then now are our good stories. Yes, we've had some moments that definitely now they're the, the, the juiciest stories. Yeah. Um, so should we move on to our sure. next reflection? Our next reflection is re in regards to tiny home living. Now, this is a killer photo. Um, I wonder, should we tell them what this is or make them guess and see if anybody guesses it? Come tell us. Thank you. Yeah. Well, no, because we're talking about resources. We should tell them what this is. This is the world's largest salt factory. This is located in Guerrero Negro in Baja Sur. Oh, no, Baja Sur. It's just Baja, California. It's right at the corner. It's right, it's right at the, right the edge. Right at the border. Um, the, but this is in the Baja Lopez. Peninsula. And this is the world's largest salt factory, not just sea salt salt um this is in the very far distance there you can see this is the ocean and um in this it's a lagoon that has particularly saline waters so they pump it into these huge 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 evaporation pools and then in this particular region there's a lot of wind a lot of sun and so you have the perfect recipe and of course very saline seawater uh, you have the perfect recipe to be able to uh, produce a lot of salt so and interestingly too this this lagoon is the is basically the the place where uh gray whales go to give birth because mm -hmm. uh because of this the, the the huge amount of salt in the water uh the baby can flow better and they can you know teach them how to swim and hunt in a safe environment which is really cool yeah so um, this is where the gray whales that travel then all the way up to Alaska to feed. Um, this is where they are born. And these lagoons right there. Um, so we got this photo. We weren't allowed to be there, but we went. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a killer photo. But the, the, the point of this, of this reflection, I wanted to use this photo because we wanted, I wanted to talk about resources um, on the tiny home living front whether you're living in a mobile tiny home or you're living in a stationary tiny home, um, something that's really interesting that happens is you become, especially if it's an off-grid tiny home, uh, you become hyper and super aware of your resources, water, electricity, any other sort, form of energy that you rely on. For us, it's propane. Um, and food as well. And food, yeah. Um, um, yeah, so we, like, just for instance, just today, we have a water filter that we needed to change out. We have 80 gallons of, of fresh water, and we, we fill that up tw usually about twice a month, maybe three times, depending on how many showers we needed to take. Yep. And so when we do our dishes, it's like just a little trickle of water. And we're just very, very, very aware of how much water. Water usage. Or water usage. Um, you can see the, the bus, the interior is actually powered by solar. Uh, we call this the farm. <laughs> and uh, we have 10 panels now, but before we only had five. When we only had five, uh, we had to be a little more careful about the light. Now we've 
but we still we've run out a couple times even with our yeah with if, our, you, if you get a few cloudy days and yeah. you're using a lot of uh, uh you're doing a lot of computer work and you're always plugged in then yeah yeah um but it's an interesting thing that happens because you you then you if you shift away from that to living in a normal house again or in an apartment or if you're just hooked up to the grid um you become more lax. And I think it's a, it's an interesting thing. Psychologically, I'd like to understand, well, I guess I understand why that happens because you, you're very aware of your finite resources. When you're tapped into a grid, you're not, you're not seeing the water go down as you're using it. You're not seeing the level of the batteries go down as you're using power. Um, it's just a very interesting kind of shift in way of living. Um, yeah, and when it comes to the food as well, uh, our fridge is really small, so. And the storage space for for dry food, it's also uh, limited. So, if we're going to be out in the middle of nowhere, where it's it's, it's far away to to get to resources, uh, you have to plan well and also uh, don't overuse what you need to overuse. That if you just have it, you know, just like that water, for example, and take a long shower when you have plenty of water, and you think. Oh, just plenty of water. It can take a five minute shower, 10 minute shower. For us, that have to be like a minute shower. You know, you just wet yourself a little bit, put some soap, close the water, and then turn it on just to rinse really quick. So you can um, yeah, extend the, the, the water that you have in your tank and also the electricity. Uh, I constantly got to be checking the weather. Uh, so we have to be more careful with our uh, battery bank and electricity usage because. We're gonna get two days. There's gonna be cloudy, so the batteries are not gonna uh, fill up all the way to the top. So you know, keep the lights turned off, the lights that we don't need, and make sure that all the batteries uh, need to be charged uh, before we get to that those cloudy days, and and so on. Yeah. So yeah, essentially, like if tomorrow when we have the bus open for and and we're just going to be available for anybody to come talk and have any long conversations about stuff. If anybody's really interested in the tiny house living, especially off-grid and the pros and cons of an off-grid solar system, if you want to nerd out about that, come hang out because we will, we can nerd out about that all day long. Because <laughs> there's some sticky things, you know, oh, yeah. off-grid, off-grid, but off-grid, off-grid, off-grid means batteries, 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 yeah. and that's an issue. And so, it comes with many challenges. Yeah. So we'd love to nerd out with you about that if you'd like to. <laughs> I think we have time for like one more reflection mm -hmm. before we jump into. So there's a couple. I think we already kind of talked about this, the awesome that comes from the bad. Mm -hmm. We've said like, yeah, there's we've had some can expand on the bad experiences that ended up being awesome blessings in disguise. Um, but. I mean, the biggest one is a tire blowout. We had a massive tire blowout and he was stranded. I was in a different part of the country calling and figuring out tires and toes. And he had to hike 30 minutes up a mountain to be able to get signal. I mean, it was a disaster in the moment, but once that the resolution to that disaster actually led us to a town that we never planned to stop at, at all, um, which led to some of those murals that we showed you that that arts council building and the, the coffee shop. Those were murals that came from us being in this town we never planned to be in. And in that town, I got opportunities to play music that I never would have had before we were able to I was able to play enough. And we the sponsored the sponsored murals paid uh, enough for your time that we were actually able to cover the cost of those tires that we had to replace because we had a blowout and everything it was just this like it was so cool how the disaster itself shifted into it's like it it took you have like a, a plug in a wall and this this instance this this one thing that happens takes that plug and goes and then plugs you into a completely different future a completely different set of people completely different set of ex experiences and i think uh yeah, when, when something really bad happens, try and see it like that, that maybe that was just the universe doing that for you and, and all these other things happen that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Yeah. So 
Silver Linings playbook right there. Yeah, and <laughs> on this photo to get to this place, oh, yeah. we, we actually got stuck pretty bad. And, <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, but the beauty of uh, humanity, and you know, we all like to help each other. We got rescued by the Mexican uh, National Guard. They have a base nearby, and they came with their four by four and and got us on stock. And then we got the opportunity to to spend a couple of nights in this amazing sand dunes right next to the Pacific Ocean. And it was a beautiful experience that turned into many other good things. Uh, Cora got to record a portion of a music video there. And uh, uh, we got to meet some local people as well. And it was just a beautiful experience. Yeah, I actually got stuck coming out of there too. <laughs> yeah. so we got stuck going in, <laughs> we got stuck coming out. It was like, a book ended with issues with like mini disaster bookends but the in-between part couldn't have happened without either of those taking place like there's no way that we could have the bus parked here and we were not going to get stuck well we almost got out but we turned the wheel and then and then it was game over but these things happen um and like I said, they, it's, it's beautiful when you, when you start to see, it's not just so much silver lining. It's like, it's kind of like you flip it around rather than saying like, there's this big cloud and I can see the good as the silver lining. It's kind of like you flip it around and, and you say, um, the, the, the silver lining is the bad part. And, and the cloud is actually the good thing that that silver lining uh, facilitated. Yeah. Um, I think, Actually, yeah, there's, there's time for, well, we can, yeah, we can say our next, mm -hmm. next, next. <laughs> so I was explaining to John earlier, the whole thing with Alaska. So we built the bus in 2019, correct? Yeah, we finished it uh, around August 2019. August 2019. And our plan had been finish it in the spring of 2019, make it to Alaska. The route was originally going to go like this. Here was in Florida. And we we're going to go whoop, summer 2019 and then be able to make our way down. Um, well, we made it this far before, you know, since we finished in August, finished the bus in August, we made it this far before uh, it just got too cold. And uh, that we did not build the bus for winter conditions, nor would we ever want to try and drive it on the Alcan. And no, never. Um, so we thought that's okay. We'll just go in summer 2020. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we could not cross the board, obviously, in summer 2020. We could have gotten ourselves across the border summer 2021. But the issue with that was that um, Canada was allowing people to get to Alaska if they had a good reason, but they gave you a route and a deadline. And if you, def if you deviated from that route, they would fine you a lot. So essentially, if we wanted to do Alaska last summer, we would have missed Canada. And this is the trip of the Americas, connecting with communities across the Americas. So how can you miss Canada? Canada's kind of important. <laughs> yep. So we said, okay, well, we're going to push then for summer 2022. And that's where we are. We are kind of the bullet went out of the gun two days ago. You guys are our first stop on our way up towards Alaska. Next stop is Montreal, then Marathon in Ontario. Not, I don't know if it's Ontario. It's right at the tip of, above Lake Superior. And then after that, it's Alaska, baby. And wish us luck. And we don't know what's going to be in between. <laughs> We have no uh, idea. Marathon in Alaska, but I'm pretty sure we'll find some projects and community projects to do. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing. We're not trying to push too much with the planning because of what we talked about before. Uh, if we plan too much, then the things that will inevitably start happening as we start driving around here, we want to be able to say yes to, to those things. So we're just going to kind of live and let die and just yeah, and start driving and see what happens. And also another thing that prevents us for, from planning like six months ahead is the fact that we had a lot of cost breakdowns. So if you plan too far ahead and then, then you have to reshift so many things. So we have talked about not planning maybe no more than three months ahead because yeah. uh, in Mexico, we did a whole engine rebuild that took three weeks. Yeah. And uh, those, those are things that we can control, you know, and they will happen. It's part of the journey. So we 
try to plan little by little. Yeah, we, we, we actually had a little bit of a scare this morning. Yes, well, yesterday driving on the way to Ellsworth, a light came on, a worn engine light came on, and then the bus stopped, right? Yeah, I was in the middle of a, a traffic light just, and it just turned off. Turned off. So I tried to stay calm, put on neutral, tried to start again, and it fired up right away. And then I was able to drive, no issues. And then <laughs> that was a scary moment. <laughs> and then this morning it came on again. Um, so, but then it turned off. So we're here right now, and it could be like a little something that we might have to deal with with the bus in Ellsworth. So, so now, this is why planning is like a flexible thing. Yeah, so now so. Monday, we got to take it to, to a shop to, to get a diagnosis on that. Yeah. So never dull moment. And uh, now I think we've got, yeah, we've got our time for questions. And I also wanted to say, you know, tomorrow, um, basically the whole day, we're going to be there with the bus, welcoming anybody to come in and, and tour and ask questions. So if you have questions and you really want to get into it deep, come see us. And we'll also be also play music on the front lawn at 430. So music, but for questions and all that, um, for, for the, the good conversations that you want to have, we come find us because we like to gab. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, thank you so, so very much indeed. Um, folks, time for some questions for right now. And just want to reiterate that they're gracious enough to offer open house for the bus tomorrow. So, spread the word, particularly tiny house enthusiasts. You might want to come and check that out. And also, artists that like to travel. Um, and then 4.30 tomorrow afternoon on the front lawn, um, they may move the bus over there and they'll be playing. Um, hopefully the weather's gonna be as nice as it is today. So questions either jump right in, um, asking them or you can post things in the chat. And already Ken Klein has posted, are you still doing the Wanderer film? Cora, I can read the chat if you want to handle the questions. So I will unmute. Um, hi, Ken. <laughs> um, so Wanderer, the, the music video for Wanderer, uh, the song is out. Um, uh, I, are you referring to the the idea of the documentary film in the end? Yeah. Um, yes. So one of the things that we're working on as we go is trying to film as much as we can and create eventually when we're done with the project, a documentary film. Uh, we, who knows what it'll be called? Maybe it'll be called Wonder, or it might just be called Aren't We There Yet? Who knows? Who knows? Uh, one thing we've learned that there's so much there's just so much that we've we have like 20 terabytes of data yeah. already <laughs> we haven't even left really the united states very much so there's just so much that's happening that we if we were to try and distill that into like a 90 minute or even two hour or three hour documentary there we'd be cutting so much out so what we decided to do is be producing youtube videos as we go so um, like twice a month now, every Sunday, we're putting a YouTube video out that's telling the story of the project so that we can get into all that, that fun stuff that's happening so that at least the story is told in its entirety somewhere. And then yes, eventually at the very end, there will be like a distilled version, um, which it's gonna be kind of heartbreaking for us, I think, to have a distilled version because we'll be like, it's, you're missing everything. <laughs> but that's why we're doing the YouTube thing so that the story yeah. is told somewhere. Yeah, essentially with the YouTube videos, we every time we paint a mural, we document the whole thing. And this is something we started recently. Uh, before we were just documenting the murals with time lapses. And, but now they have more of the story behind and how these murals impact the communities and how the connections happened and everything that happened in between the beginning of the mural and the end of it. And then what happens when we move from one location to the next? Yeah. This is wondering how do you strike the balance between healthy, sustainable source food, affordability, and limited storage space, especially for parish space? Go. Yeah. <laughs> He's the chef. <laughs> well, we have limited space in the bus, like I said uh, earlier. Uh, 
we got a decent sized uh, fridge and uh, we love uh, healthy eating and fresh food because it's, uh, it's, it's not just healthy, but it's also uh, cheaper. And I am lucky that I really love cooking and Cora love doing the dishes. So we have a really good team right here. <laughs> <laughs> so right. um we 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 um have a very balanced diet um, for me coming from nicaragua i kind of turned cora into nicaraguan because our the staple of our diet is rice and beans so we got we buy lots of rice and beans <laughs> that is easy to store and and cheap to buy a lot of it um uh, the veggies is a struggle because we can keep veggies for too long but locally every chance that we get a uh, chance to stop uh, we refill the, the fridge, which lasts us somewhere between, I don't know, one week to, to 12 days, maybe on, on veggies and stuff like that. And we try to rotate things. The freezer is, uh, is big enough for, for to freeze some, some meat and stuff. Uh, yeah, and water we have, depending on how careful we are with the water and how hot the weather where we are in uh, will determine how many showers we have to take. <laughs> so um, sometimes we can go two weeks on uh, 80 gallons of water. And sometimes we, we can only do maybe 12 days to 10 days. And the interesting part is most of the water goes to doing the dishes, which is it's a dilemma that we have. If we use a lot of disposable uh, dishes and plates and, and silverware, it doesn't seem very environmental friendly to us. Um, but on the other, on the other end, we have to do a lot of dishes, which we spent a lot of water. So we decided to just, you know, get regular plates and silverware and try it for when she does the dishes, but basically maybe water trickle and, so and that helps a lot. It's, there's a science to it at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think definitely in the, in the, the trifecta there, Rebecca is the thing that's hardest for us is the the sustainably sourced food because we'll often have to do we're on a super budget with our life on the road so oftentimes we're not able to spring for the the best stuff that we know we should be getting uh, and that's where yeah but we try and balance that out with the fact that it's you know at least the food that we are eating is still all veggies but sometimes we're not able to get the organic versions not all the time yeah. you know when when it's when it's available and affordable, we definitely do it. And but it's something that since we are constantly moving, you're in a town for three weeks uh, painting a mural, and you figure out where to get your stuff, and then you move, and then you have to refigure it out again. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's a constant constant thing to to work with. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? I know we have like two minutes left. Riley is saying thank you so much for the talk. It's truly beautiful and inspiring to see what you feel accomplished and being able to do. Do you stay in contact with the communities you work with? Absolutely. You want to talk about that? You go ahead. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And there's the beauty, the beauty of social media is that we can um, stay in touch with everybody. And even on top of that, you know, they can tag us if they ever um, uh, Take a picture, in front, Take a of a picture in front of the mural or, or anything related to the mural. And we find that in, in the communities, oftentimes the mural becomes like the backdrop for the prom photos or, you know, this photo for this, or somebody does product photos or something. And it's like, oh, we're doing it in front of our mural. And then they tag us. We're like, oh, that is so cool. It's just really fun to see um, how, I think I was telling somebody else this the other day, but it's really fun to see how the community completely takes and feels ownership over it, which is exactly what we wanted. We, the last thing we would ever want is to give the impression that we're the artists that like come in and like paint something and then move on. And it's not, a, it's not about that. It's about the community feeling the ownership of that piece. They put their hands on it, they helped make it. And so that when we go, it's not like, oh, that's the thing those people did. It's more like, oh, that's our friends who came. And then we, we, made this mural together. And this is our mural about our town. And, and over and over, we feel like we see on social media glimpses of that. And there's, there's just like nothing, nothing better. 
Yeah. And those posts come through. Yeah, those mirrors have a big impact because uh, besides the ownership they get, uh, they this for for the people who participate, it also serves uh, some sort of uh, therapy. Uh, the teachers uh, ask us, can we come also paint? Because you know we need a mom, moment of relaxation, and they come and they get in their own world, you know, and they get their section of mural. They're in charge of painting, and it's just beautiful how they come always to talk to us and say how beautiful and and relaxing that, that was. And and then after we're gone, we all, often get comments back that how much they're enjoying the mural and what a fun experience it was. Yeah. And the fr friendships also that get built because sometimes we go into a town and there's volunteers that didn't know it and don't know each other. And then, you know, a new friendship grew from that, from that project. Between those people, Between yeah. Those, there, yeah. There was, um, I know we're just at the end of our time, but there was this one place where we went, this woman she came up to us after we, we were there for like a couple of weeks and we helped do two murals and the arts council was very involved uh with even painting it themselves which is cool that i guess the arts council had just formed and then our mural projects were kind of their first team building exercise how cool is that and there was this woman she had just moved to town three months earlier and she came to us and she said guys you don't realize what you just did like i moved to town i've been so lonely i didn't know how i couldn't make any friends i didn't know how to meet anybody and i've been almost debating whether i made the wrong decision moving here uh, I've been really getting sad and but then you guys came and I saw this opportunity to volunteer and I got out on the wall and painting and I'm meeting all these people and I've, I just found my tribe and that's beautiful <laughs> like wow that's amazing and I think the last little story in that same vein would be about the kids remember the the in-school suspension kids in Tanglewood mm -hmm. yeah so our very first mural was this um, middle school in Greenville, South Carolina, um, really rough school, really not rough neighborhood, awesome teachers, awesome staff, awesome kids, just bad circumstances. And so we went there, painted this mural, and we had groups of kids that they would send us. And we were just like taking them as they came. We we're like just trying to get it paint to everybody. And there was one group that came you know that they were great painted and you know just really chill kids and super like just in the zone meditative really calm chill and off they went and it wasn't until later that we found out that those were like the they were the bad kids they said <laughs> the teacher said she said you guys you, they sent you who they sent you who these were the in-school suspension kids they were like they were suspended in school basically locked in a classroom all day with a mean teacher and she sent them to us <laughs> we had we had no idea it was one of the best group it was the best group and they were just in the zone and that's that is like the beautiful experience to have sharing you know because and those were some of the same kids that when we left they were like that's the part i paid that's the part it's very much about them and ownership in their school and, and a beautiful thing that is connected to the question is that a lot of these kids especially the ones that are in middle school and high school and they have you know their social media they follow us and uh, a few of them comment on our stuff so hopefully you know for them seeing the project continue going to other communities will be inspirational to them in some ways yeah i think that's our time i know everybody's got um places to be and dinner time any last questions, folks? Um, I just I just want to say thank you so, so much. And I'm going to be absolutely obsessing tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and I have a whole bunch of questions and conversations. Um, but uh, is there a specific time? Because um, I, I want to kind of like sneak out of work because I have a lot of back to back things tomorrow. But um, or will you just be around all day until um, four, four, four o'clock? I'll be up at eight. You probably get. Yeah, I'll be. I'll be, we'll be up at well. eight. Yeah. So come anytime. Um, yeah. Anytime. If you want to join us for coffee, you can join us for coffee. <laughs> um, and then we'll have to move the bus around three thirty, probably. We'll move the bus over and then get everything set up. And then after playing music for a bit, we'll probably move the bus back. So I don't know. Five, probably around six ish. We'll be back there. But even when the when I'm playing music we'll have the bus open and people can go inside. Yeah. But 
Yeah. And I'm pretty sure after the, the music, we'll, we can stay a little bit longer there answering questions as well yeah. and giving tours for whoever missed the chance to go in the bus. And then even tomorrow into the evening, I mean, yeah. we don't have plans to go out or anything. We'll exactly. just be, yeah. we'll be there. So I think our cutoff time tomorrow may be nine, say. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Uh -oh. Well, thank you both so very much indeed. This has just been marvelous. And <laughs> thank you everybody for coming indoors and online on this beautiful day. And definitely looking forward to seeing the bus and hearing music tomorrow um, during the course of the day. So great to see you all and hopefully see, see you back next, next week for our next episode of the Human Ecology Forum. Everybody <laughs> take care. Bye.